Welcome to Developer Diaries with Ben Wilson in association with the All About Property Facebook group. Hello and welcome to the third edition of Developer Diaries with me, Ben Wilson. Um, Initially, at the beginning of every show, as you know, I will start with a market update before being joined by a guest later in the show. Um, So going ahead with the market update, things have been pretty interesting in the property market uh, as of late. We we saw prices falling at the tail end of last year with all the various rate rises that came about and the issues with the uh, quasi quiet Anglers Trust government. Luckily, since then, things seem to have steadied out. Um, we're looking at the two and five year swap rates on interest rates. We're finding that uh, it's likely that we're getting quite close to the peak of where interest rates are going to be. Certainly from speaking to mortgage brokers and people working in the city, Um, trading interest rates, they are all saying the same thing, which is that they expect possibly another rate rise or two, but certainly hopefully not more than that. And this should trickle down into the property market. We should find, therefore, that things are more buoyant than perhaps they were looking three months ago. Um, From speaking to estate agents as well on the ground, people are saying there has been a bit of a spike in interest since the third week of January, which historically things are very quiet anyway in December and January, and we expect things to pick up. Moving into Feb and the, the, the best time of year historically to sell is March, April, May and then September, October. So we would expect an upturn, but I think there's been more of an upturn than perhaps we realised, which is great news. Um, I think first time buyer markets are still struggling a little bit and that will probably continue. Um, one thing we've also noticed, as we spoke about on the, on the last two shows, the dollar driven areas in London have seen upturns. Uh, there's a lot of American money swilling around. Obviously, the pound's incredibly cheap still, and that makes it very compelling to buy UK property for American investors and those also holding dollars from other countries. So we will continue as a company to keep buying in those areas. Um, and uh, we see that that being a bit of a safer bet at the moment. So now that we've done the market update, um, it's time to introduce our guest today. As mentioned on the last podcast, we're going to alternate uh, doing one month with uh, a guest uh, who is someone who works in either the property industry and has a lot to to give back or someone who is just a successful entrepreneur with a great story to tell. And then the the next month, we will be doing a more technical podcast based on something like um, explaining lease extensions, the art of design. Uh, whatever it may be. So this week, well, this month, I should say, we've got uh, a guest on. And I'm really excited to say we're joined by Chris Johnson, uh, who is the Managing Director of Clarence Property Group. Chris has worked in the property industry for 27 years now. He's purchased in excess of 300 units of property, um, including 170 unit portfolio. Uh, He's got a lot of experience. He's really uh, done a lot of great deals, and uh, I'm really excited to be joined by him now. So, Chris, welcome to Developer Diaries. Thank you for agreeing to come on. Um, I've I've had a we've spoken about your CV, and I've had a good look at your website, and it's safe to say you've you've done a lot in property. Mm -hmm. And um, you're the sort of guest we want because we, as I say, we want to be educational to people and have people that have really experienced it and. Acquiring over 300 units is, is a lot. I mean, I've, I've probably done 30 or 40, mm-hmm. so you're well ahead of me. Um, so that's that's really impressive. Um, so I guess let's get straight into it. And um, what's, what's your, how did you get into property? What's your background? Okay, well, thanks for having me, first of all. No worries. Uh, um, so it wasn't a, a direct route into the industry at all. Um, I started an agency yeah. uh, in the late 90s, 90s yeah, yeah. 95, 96. Um, and um, it's kind of just something I stumbled into. Yeah. I didn't have a set career path. Um, I was at the time I was renting flats yeah. um, and, and doing flat shares. And every estate agent I knew had a very nice German saloon, <laughs> uh, nice suits. And um, I thought, well, I could, you know, I can do that. I can't yeah, yeah. fancy a bit of that. Um, so I gave it gave it a go. And, and like a lot of uh, negotiator starting off an agency, you kind of get thrown in on a single swim basis. Yeah. Low basics. And Remember if you, that. If you, yeah. If you can sell, <laughs> then you'll make money. Um, and uh, so, so it's an agency background initially. Uh, Northwest London. So Wills and Green. I worked um, Hendon, Neasden, nice. Harrowfield, and then mostly in West Hampstead. That's yeah. where the sort of um, yeah. where I worked mostly, which was, which was very enjoyable. Yeah, there's a lot of development going on in West Hampshire at the moment. I don't know if you've gone through lately. Huge, there's yeah. Huge. They've built all around the station. They're building more. I'm yep. probably aware of it. Um, 
so in terms of going, so you were, you're an agency, which is that's how I started out. So I remember being chucked in at the deep end. Northwest London's a really interesting place, I think, to be an agent because there's, there's a lot of big property names in Northwest London and it's quite competitive. Mm-hmm. So it's probably a good place for you to have started, I reckon. Um, so how did you go from that to then setting up uh, CPG, if I can, Clarence Property Group? Well, it's a bit of a gap between um, <clears throat> between agency and, and setting up uh, Clarence. Um, I, I, I reached a stage where I, um, I wouldn't say I was bored, but I was ready for a new challenge uh, mm. in, in agency. I, you know, I enjoyed agency a lot, I enjoyed yeah. the process. Um, always had a lot of enthusiasm, yeah. Um, but um, you know, working in a corporate structure, um, you know, that you were only ever going to earn so much. There were some limitations. Yeah. I didn't really fancy being a <coughs> climbing the, the corporate pole and, and becoming a manager and a regional manager. Yeah, yeah. I did look into getting my own agency, yeah. um, either a yeah. franchise or, or starting from scratch. Expensive, isn't it? Very expensive. <laughs> you need a lot of backing, um, yeah. which I, which I didn't have. Um, so uh, naturally, working as an agent in Northwest London, there was mm. an, an awful lot of developers and traders and investors. Um, it, it particularly coming into agency in the late nineties, where um, you know the property market had been in a bit of a, a, a slump, yeah. and for a lot of agents, developers were their lifeblood. So there'd be there'd be a lot of repossessions. Developers would buy them, um, give them back. Yep. to the selling agent, refurbish, yeah, ready yeah. to sell on again. So those relationships with developers were hugely important for, for high street agents. Yeah. When I first came in. It's changed a bit now, hasn't it? It has. <coughs> Unfortunately yeah. for us, yeah. uh, as developers. Yeah, it's, har- <laughs> it's harder, uh, definitely. And and I think, but it, developers have to be more imaginative now about where they source their properties. So yeah, yeah. It was a lot, it was a lot easier, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I hear many tales probably before my time <laughs> of, of developers just ringing up receivers ringing up banks saying yeah, what, yeah. What, what, what keys have you had from can't do that anymore <laughs> no no not legally <laughs> no um so i uh, they were the natural conversations that i had in yeah. terms of moving on and you were drawn to that development side of the business were you N- not initially no. I, I i think my primary choice would have been to set up my own agency really yeah um, uh, um so that was kind of secondary but it was easier for me to get started uh, and i had uh, quite a bit of choice yeah, yeah. Um, different characters that I knew, yeah. Uh, and I and I and I kind of approached somebody who seemed to be very prolific in the area, had a very good reputation, had a yeah. good, good branding, yeah. Uh, and was you know someone I perceived to be fun to work with, yeah. Uh, and, and I was right, he, he was, yeah. Um, and um, uh, took it from there really, and just just threw myself into it, and 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 from day one it was entirely on a. You know, you're gonna you're gonna eat what you kill and, and nothing else. Nice. So that was you cutting your teeth as you as you yes. went to work for yes. for a, a success quite a large developer uh, or locally locally successful. large. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not a high street name, but um, but very well known in northwest London. And um, you know, I, I suppose the job description would be runner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it evolved very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the time I, I fun uh, job though. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Uh, but it was the learning. Um, to work under somebody with their experience, yeah. um, with their network of contacts, yeah. um, and just sort of absorbing the way they go about it, the way yeah. they talk to people, the way they source opportunities, yeah, yeah. Um, was was massive. You know, yeah, so you. it's a real. Uh, I mean, I, I've got, I've had, uh, I had a, a, a runner working for me previously, um, and then I've got someone who, who works for me now, and I'm sort of training him up, hopefully to to do things. It's, it's actually, I think. Putting deals together is actually very difficult. Mm-hmm. If you even even if you were to take a hundred estate agents, I would say probably only five or ten percent of them would be able to put deals together mm-hmm. professionally. It's a really difficult skill, and I and I always think, especially where we'll come on to more more what you do, but when you're when you're dealing as well and you're you're buying below the trade price and then flipping on to someone like me who's then going to build it out. That's really difficult, mm-hmm. and um, I'm always a little bit in awe of people that just seem to have contacts and managed to just do all these lovely deals and just trade exchange back to back constantly I just think you know it's, it'd be nice if I never had to, to build anything but equally I, I love the design aspect of, mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. building so so you so you work for for the developer and then what why did you decide that you didn't want to be there anymore you wanted to move on and do your own thing just was it to make your more money or well, it was after 17 years and on day one you, you were with him 17 years 17 years yeah. wow yeah, very yeah, loyal yeah, yeah. <laughs> so on day one I needed his knowledge I needed his reputation yeah. I needed his branding 
I needed his money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as the years ticked by, I kind of built my own um, uh, reserves of cash. I, I, and your reputation. My reputation. Um, and, um, you know, my knowledge base grew, you know, from learning from, from him, but also, yeah. you know, from learning from my own experiences. Yeah. What was he particularly good at that you really picked up on? Was there a particular part of the business that you thought he was shit hot on? Uh, I, th- I think, um, you know, the, the various ways of sourcing opportunities, relationship building, yeah. uh, you know, identifying... Um, the opportunity, understanding, um, you know, understanding what was a, a really good opportunity and what wasn't, yeah. and why it was a good opportunity yeah. and, and why it wasn't. Um, understanding the full cycle, um, uh, you know, so, so almost winding the tape forward from from minute one. You know, how are we going to buy it? Yeah. What, what, what are we going to pay for it? And what's our exit route? Yeah. And um, what's your exit if it if yeah, it doesn't work out? Exactly. What's your secondary exit? You know, you can't just run around collecting flats. Um, yeah, be nice, in, it? <laughs> in that role, um, uh, and, and likewise, you know, understand what is, what makes the deal work, and make sure it's not just the market, not yeah. just a rising market, because that will help you in the in those markets, in the rising markets. Yeah. But when, if you, if you learn and you're educated to buy very well, then you can buy well and trade in any market. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, including totally. Including markets. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So um, a lot of a lot of. Um, Contemporaries, you know, throughout the years, you, you seem very, very successful. I used to see guys with bundles of contracts in auction rooms. I thought, yeah. how are you buying all these properties in auctions and mm. making money? And it, it, it wasn't necessarily their brains; it was the market. But of course, when the music stops, less contracts know, that, around. <laughs> that mo suddenly yeah. doesn't work anymore. Yeah, well, it's, it was interesting. The the, the the chap that kindly introduced us, um, I won't, won't mention, but a good good friend of mine. And someone who's who's something of a mentor to me has been over the years. I, I, when I was an agent, he was uh, sort of one of the developers I was dealing with. He one thing he taught me was that when you're buying a deal, the provenance of a deal is quite important. So if it looks like a deal in in terms of it's a really distressed seller, they're being re, they're going to be repossessed tomorrow. It's likely that it's going to be a good deal because sometimes you you get a deal where you, where there's no there's no real reason why it should be a deal. It's just it's fairly cheap, and you think, oh well, I really need to buy something, so I'll buy it. And I think as I've become more experienced as a developer, I've looked more for the deals where, you know, the the sort of history of how it's come to me also backs up the fact that it's a good deal. And they tend to be better deals, which may sound obvious, but it's not obvious, I think, when you start out in the industry, because I used to just sort of look purely at the numbers, like, it says this, it says that, this is the GDV, this is my yield. Um, whereas now we probably buy more deals where, if you look at the story, there's more yeah. of a, something that's happened in the past that means it's going to be very cheap. But vendor profile is is very important. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a better way of, of, of wording it. But you know what I was getting at. Yeah. Um, so, so then you set up um, CPG. So, yes. how, what was that like? Joe, I mean, was, I'm sure, but he must have been gutted when you left. I would have thought. Or was um, it a natural end to it? Um, I think he understood. Yeah, I think he understood, and and and, um, and and was pleased for me in a way. You know, as it should have been. That's you nice. know, he he. Um, you know, Seventeen to, years of you. You know, to build, to build some, and to give someone that ex- opportunity and that experience, yeah. to then be able to go off and um, uh, and uh, do their own thing. Um, but yeah, I'm sure. You know, it, I mean, we together worked trying to recruit um, someone to work under me, and it was always very difficult to find somebody as you already had yeah. identified. You know, where are you going to source this? Um, this new talent from you know agency yeah um i think having a property background is hugely important um understanding the life cycle of a, a, an owner occupier transaction yeah, yeah so you understand the process but also why people buy things you know be in the room with them when that when you can see it in their eyes when you know they're going to buy it yeah yeah and and understanding why so but it's very difficult you know either people wanted to go straight from knowing nothing to sitting uh, having lunch at the arts club or having their feet <laughs> up on the desk laughing and yeah, telling yeah. jokes without doing any of that work in between to, yeah. get, to, get, to get to that point. Um, or they were very talented and learned extremely quickly, yeah. absorbed everything that you taught them and cleared off after. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I think in, in this business, because if you're able to master it, and when I say master it, I don't mean master the whole necessarily the whole business, but if you're able to master buying below market value and exiting and making, let's say, 20% return on cost on, on your deals fairly consistently. That is a very attractive proposition to a lot of investors who aren't in property. And when they see you, if you're, you know, if your return on equity on a deal's 
40, 50, 60, 70 percent in 12 months, which it can easily be, it can be more than that. I'm sure you'll tell me when we speak. But um, you often find that the really talented people end up getting snapped up by investors and then leaving, like you say. Mm -hmm. So you keep them for a couple of years and they think, well, you know, it's great that I'm earning 100 grand a year working for a developer that's earning 2 million a year, but I want to make 2 million a year, so I'm going to go off. Now, I'm not saying all developers make 2 million a year, but just uh, exaggerating slightly. But you'd take that. If you could have someone for two to five years and they learn and clear off, then yeah. you'd take that. You'd certainly take of course. Seven, you'd certainly yeah. take 17 years. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You, you did your time. I certainly did my time. <laughs> so, however upsetting it was, you know. Was, well, you know, I think, um, I think you know, everyone blossoms and goes on. It's, it's, it's just part, part of the course, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, so you set up CPG. Yes. And what was the initial? So when you were when you were you must have had sort of a blueprint or a business plan of what you thought you were going to be doing. What, what how f different is it now from what it was on day one when you started out? Is it exactly a, a thought or? Well, I kind of the timing was was interesting because we were coming emerging from that sort of post um, death of the buy to yeah. let market. Yeah. You know, in, in, you know, with the additional um, surcharge on stamp duty. Um, you know the announcements of the of, of abolishing the tax relief um, on interest um, and and the escalating of making it harder and harder for private landlords. So that took away a huge chunk of the market. So the market yep. was was tricky coming out of 2016 all the yep. way really till Boris bounced in 2019. Yeah. Well, the peak was 2014, I would say, in London. Yeah, yeah, for certainly, us. T t certainly 14, 15. Yeah. Um, so it was a, quite a tricky period. But mm. you know, as I said earlier, having worked in Having learned from one of the best and learning to work in very different markets, rising, falling, um, seasonal, yeah, yeah. Um, stagnant, uh, you know, you accept that. Um, so the, the, the idea, and I, uh, the timing wasn't was 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 no accident really. I, I, the idea of moving on and having my own entity, I probably had three or four years earlier. Yeah. Um, but what I didn't want to do was um, was change the um, volume of deals that I was doing or the the, the lot size. So, you know, I, I was involved in a lot of portfolio acquisitions, um, and, and and really, it was, it, lim it was limitless in terms of um, uh, the the number of, of of deals we could I could bring in. Um, they obviously had to be the right deals. Um, yeah. But you know, so to go from that to being all of a sudden, well, no, I can only buy X number of deals. Smaller ones, or, yeah. Or, or, or what I did, I didn't want that, so I waited until I was in a stronger position to be able to. Fine, from a capital point yeah. of view, to be able to buy bigger portfolios. Yeah, with, with it, within reason, looking at the, the volume of deals I was bringing in personally yeah. over, over the years, you know, and, and could I continue to do that? I accepted there would be some limitations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, in the early days. Um, so really, it was to do more of the same. I didn't want to reinvent myself. Um, yeah. um, and stick to what you're good at, basically, which is always a good idea in business, I think. Stick to what you're good at. Yeah. But another one of the motivations, I suppose, was um, having a, a very, for a, quite a long time, a very set way of doing things yeah. and, and, and kind of inherited. You know, this, yeah. is our, this is what we buy, this is how we buy it, and this is the way we operate. And the more, I, uh, more experience I had, you know, it, you always start thinking, well, I wouldn't mind doing it this way. I wouldn't mm -hmm. mind this this approach. I'd like to try, and, you know, um, you know, ex extend my experience more into this type of property. Yeah, you know, you, you get bored otherwise, don't you? I mean, if you're so you, if you're similar to me, you're probably quite restless and you want to always try new things yeah, and keep yeah, moving. Yeah, I, I always wanted to buy everything. I want I want everything <laughs> to work. Every opportunity. You and me both. <laughs> when when it comes on my desk, I want to find a way to make it work. And as you said earlier, the you know, where it's come from, who offered it to you, the vendor profile gives you all the clues. Yeah, yeah. It probably dictates your enthusiasm. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but even something that's, you know, yeah. doesn't tick all those boxes, I'm still um, desperate to make it work. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose as a company in my previous partnership, um, you know, there were things we, we, we chose not to buy and I thought, well, I would have liked to have done that. Or we've bought it and we've disposed of it in yeah. X, Y and Z fashion. And I thought... I wouldn't have minded doing it in a slightly yeah. different way. So having my own entity and, and being in charge of my own destiny, it was, um, you know, I was, I'd have those choices and I was willing, and this was really important. It was, it, when you're working with another partnership with somebody who's been around a, a bit longer, you are protected from making some mistakes. Yeah. Because they've learned before. Or, and it's their money. And it's their, mo and it's yeah. their money. Um, I wanted to. I was prepared to make my own mistakes because yeah. that's how you. That's how you learn. That that, that leads to personal growth, and you know, 
17 years prior I was a runner by the time I left you know I was an equity partner in in a huge number of the deals that we did and we also had a uh, an investment company with stock, stock that we were holding um, sort of for medium and did you keep uh, your interest in that investment company? We, or I did. For, I did for a number of years. We have since disposed um, yeah. for other reasons, nothing to do with yeah, the yeah. partnership dissolving. Well, that was good. It sounds like they were very honourable to you. Then yeah, as well. yeah, hundred percent. Because I, th- I think it's always good to leave things on a good note when you when you leave a business or when someone leaves a business. It's always, well, it's always... We've even, we've done joint ventures since. So yeah, well, that that, you know, that tells you all you need to know. We've arrived on the same doorstep. Yeah. A few times. Well, I, I was in business for about five years with a very successful food entrepreneur who was a, was a great guy, we're still good friends now, but it just ran its course, you know, and, um, you know, we've, I've borrowed money from him since then, you know, there's, um, we still get on well, we still see each other for dinner. I think, you know, this is a small industry and you don't want to slam door shut, you know, no. you want to really keep those, those relationships re- moving. And as you said, this, this whole industry is all about relationship building, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's all about being likable, people liking you and thinking, well, hang on a minute, I've got 10 people that will buy this flat off me, but Chris has bought five before, He's always done what he said. He hasn't chipped the price and screwed me at the last minute. He's always given it back to me if I'm an agent. These sort of things, it's all about you know having a good reputation, isn't it, really, above all? So, I mean, we've talked a lot about um, you, how you got into the, the business. What about the property market currently? How do you see, see things going? It's a very difficult, open-ended question. but It is. Well, I think the, the one thing, certainly, uh, to take from the last six months is that making any predictions beyond... Yeah, you know, the next. We won't hold you to it. Don't six worry. weeks to <laughs> is, 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 um, is probably well. It's certainly a lot better than it looked like it was going to be in September. Yeah, I think the the, the rise in interest rates, um, the squeeze on on you know borrowing in in terms of um, you know how cheap it was was coming. We've all known that. Um, no one predicted the um, sort of post COVID booms that we had. Yeah. Um, so we been very blessed really um and uh, it's kind of maybe artificially prolonged the, the very strong market that we had yeah. post boris 2019 um so i guess it was very dramatic in september um uh, with liz and quasi liz, liz, and, liz and quasi <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it was a bit not panic stations but you know I, I was very concerned because i had a fair bit of stock at the time yeah, yeah. um that I was uh, portfolios that I was breaking, yeah. Um, some flats that were being refurbished, um, and and a bit of um, some uh, and a sixty seven act uh, deal that oh, I was really? doing at the time, which 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 I'll maybe we'll, we'll chat about later. Yeah. And, um, uh, so I was a bit nervous, uh, and it did affect a bit of decision making. Um, uh, in, but it's certainly recovered since then. Yeah. And it seems quite steady. I think the. Um, uh, the uh, the end user market is is quite good in the affordable price points. Yeah, you know one thing we always have to remember is that life goes on, and yeah. you know land and property. There's a finite amount of it. Yeah, and we've got dem- strict planning rules. Demand outstrips <laughs> it. So yeah, like any economic um, principle. So you're fairly bullish then. Now you wouldn't have been six months ago though. So, certainly in September, I you know I I, I was a bit concerned, but I, I wouldn't say bullish. Um, <laughs> but I think there's I think there's um, I think it's going to be okay. Yeah, uh, we'll bumble along. I think we'll bumble along for this year. I mean, Maybe we'll go back to you know traditional market phases where we have seasonal peaks and troughs, where we have a busy spring. Yeah, yeah. You know, then it will quiet off in the summer, and people will be getting on with their lives, yeah. and then it will come back in September. And yeah, you know that that seems to be the norm outside of other other factors. Yeah. Well, I, in the um, in the market update I did at the beginning, I was talking about um, the fact that you know March, April, May, sort of best time of the year to sell generally and then September, October. Mm. I mean, it's very seasonal, isn't it? I mean, really, if, if something's going to come on the market in sort of December and end of January, there's not really much point putting it on. I mean, we would normally do it off market and then just test the water so that if we've come in too high, we can drop the price and launch it on like the third week of Jan. Mm. Um, likewise, July and August, obviously during COVID, it was different because people weren't going on holiday. But mm. now people go, go away for the summer holidays, the market quietens right down. So I think we both... What, what, what I said at the beginning is very similar to what you've just said. So, well, the, I think the owner occupier market underpins everything. Yeah, I'll always look at um, the activity in, in there, and it's always very useful if you have stock that you're selling because you've got yeah. first-hand experience. Um, but, but the trade market, you know, how pe- how developers are operating and how uh, the auctions um, are doing yeah. you know, in yeah. terms of their, um, you know, what's selling, what isn't. 
So. No, that's interesting. And that's probably something that I don't know enough of. So, I mean, I, I do I keep on the local market I operate in, which is sort of prime West London. I'm very much informed, I'd like to think. <laughs> but um, in terms of auctions, I probably need to probably need to look at that more. So, yeah, that's good advice for our, for our listeners. Mm. And in terms of when you're trying to quantify value, what is it that you're looking for in your business? What, what, what are your sort of buy signals, if you like? Quality of stock. Okay. Quality of source that we've already discussed. Yep. Um, so the vendor profile, the quality of stock, um, and exit. You know, yeah. How, how easy is it going to be to sell this? How to get from A to B. Uh, you know, if yeah. we're in a strong market, you, you know, it's less of an issue. But you know, th- as discussed, things can change very quickly. So you know, is this the kind of thing that you know that falls off the edge of a cliff in terms of saleability when the market changes? Yeah. You know, as, as uh, you know, buy so to, liquidity basically. Yeah, yeah. You know, buy to let stock suddenly became very difficult to sell and that really affected value of, of ex council you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe high above yield, shops maybe yeah, above shops high yeah. yielding and uh, you know uh, code, uh, code of mortgage lender criteria yeah uh, hugely affected that as well yeah yeah mortgageability um, so so yeah say it's saleability you know the, yeah. the, the, the exit routes it'd be lovely to buy lovely red brick Victorian <laughs> stock, you know, bread and butter stuff. So yeah, yeah. Like for West Hampstead, where, where I worked as an agent, a two bed garden flat there. Yeah. There'll always be demand for that, whatever yeah. the market is. Thousand pound a square foot now. <laughs> yeah. Prices have gone up. So, uh, so the key thing, so what you're saying is really, you, you, it needs to be liquid, you need to be able to get rid of it at the end. And that's, and also, presumably you'd buy on secondary roads if they were sort of less nice roads or are you looking to buy more prime spots what's your no I mean you're looking at value judge them all on their own merits but you, you know I suppose there's a, a, a sort of stress test it's not a formal stress test yeah but if it's a secondary road or it's a secondary type of stock yeah you know you know 1970s are there any other red flags there? Has, it got, yeah. has it got onerous brown rents or service charges yeah um, and he may, you know, is the, is, the, is the block well kept? Do the common parts smell? You know, little things like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that again, goes back to your experience of being a negotiator in an agency. Yeah, yeah. Because you understand all those things. Yeah. You know, if you do 20 viewings on, on a really nice flat in a purpose built block, but no one's buying it because somebody on the first floor cooks smelly fish. Yeah. Uh, and it walks into the common parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everybody, everyone's out before they even walk yeah. into the flat because, you know, horrible, smelly common parts, rubbish everywhere. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, major works that might be coming up. So yeah, yeah. Common parts Section and 20s. The ex- the exterior <clears throat> and poor condition. Um, so, yeah, so, so stress testing. Um, of, um, and it's very easy to check now. If you look in a block, yeah. have a, you can find the sales history quite easily of how quickly these flats are changing. Hands. Yeah, if it's taking months. or So if there's, if there's only two examples in the last five or six years, uh, now either everyone, no one wants to sell because it's lovely, yeah. or no one, no one is able to sell yeah. and they're all rented out. Um, yeah, and you can probably gather which is which by looking at the block. But makes sense. Yeah. And is there any any, any sort of because uh, I mean for, for myself we tend to be buying um, we tend to be buy, doing flats that are between one and five million pound GDV per unit. So they're sort of prime market, I guess. But we so we don't we wouldn't we very rarely get stuff above shops, for example. Although I have I actually did a deal of our shop in Maida Vale and I made a lot of money. It was a great deal. So we don't rule it out totally. But there, one thing I've stopped doing now is buying in blocks generally. Just from, from me, from a point of view of the neighbours, they tend to be quite tricky normally. They tend to be a bit older. And uh, not that all old people are difficult. I'm not saying that. But if you've got 50 flats and you want to get a licence for all to agreed and, and it's a share freehold building, for example, you can suddenly get yourself tidy knots. And I've bought a couple of uh, purpose-built, larger building uh, f- flats within. And uh, yeah, I've They've never been great deals. I've, I always prefer to be sort of in conversions. I think a bit more nimble. It's less people to to argue with over issues. Definitely. You know? I mean, third parties, you know, they make the files fatter and the profits smaller usually. Yeah, that's a great <laughs> saying. I mean, we, we've have found in particular with licence to alters. This year has been a nightmare for licence to alters. We've had like the quickest license is like two or three months and sometimes licensing is five six months just so many surveyors i deal with are inundated with work well i had one where i was it was, it was in streatham and it was um quite straightforward really it was a big 700 square foot one bed just screaming to be a two bed yeah um and uh i had to get the the, the license to water obviously because mm. the lease plan showed it very much you had it written yeah. this is the kitchen nice when it's just an outline isn't it yes yeah. <laughs> um and uh, they said fine i haven't got a problem with any of this yeah. but you've got everything's got to comply with current building regs but there was just no way oh. i could comply with with current building regs 
Um, so uh, it was for the sound insulation because I wanted um, wooden flooring floors. in some. They said that's fine as long as you've got the insulation. But they did their homework and it was a couple. They mm. weren't property professionals. They were and they'd done their. So they said you've got to have all the. You've got to have all the wool stuff in between the floorboards yeah, and the yeah. stairs. And I pointed out, I said, well, that's great, but you're gonna have to, we're going to have to go downstairs. And she actually refurbished the flat downstairs. And they didn't have the fire-resistant um, uh, downlights in there. Oh, so no. uh, They yeah, weren't compliant either. They, they weren't compliant. They're going to have to triple board the ceiling. Everything's going to have to... <laughs> So eventually we got there, but that's the level. If they, if, you know, if if uh, freeholders really want to stick their, you know, put their foot down, they yeah. can make it like, very difficult. I find it's often the surveyors though. I mean, I, and I, look, there's some great surveyors out there. I've got a fantastic surveyor, um, but some of the surveyors I deal with, they, I think, sometimes I feel like they're just trying to wind me up. <laughs> Maybe it's me. Maybe I've upset them. I don't think I have though. But I just I think sometimes there's, I mean it's like anything. You can be a bit jobs worth in any job in life, and you can ask too many, too for too many things. And maybe that's the case with some. But what, so, what do they care that you know they they they're less likely to be commercially minded, um, and they're going to get paid their fee whatever. And the more you argue, the more fees they charge. I know, well I know. I mean I I I, I emailed a surveyor the other day because I I I needed something responded to, and he hadn't replied to my email five days later now to me with email emails the same day or next day kind of thing unless it's a big email or at least you say i'm sorry i'm really busy i'm going to get back to you in two weeks because i'm yeah. on holiday with my wife yeah, yeah. fine but he hadn't replied to me and then of course i chased him and he got very annoyed i think i sent him a whatsapp message at 7 a.m that's probably what annoyed him <laughs> but i was quite annoyed so um anyway look we we we, we digress yes so uh, what i was asking is there anything you won't buy like total red flags well not really i no? you know, i think the stress testing um, you know, the ultimate stress test is, well, if, if it's that hot, it's got to be really cheap. You know, yeah. It's got to be really cheap. I mean, there are occasions where it, it, every red flag is raised. Mm. You know, it's a kebab shop on the ground floor. You have to go around the back to get in there. There's dog poo and syringes yeah, yeah, everywhere. Yeah. It, it, it's, uh, you know, there's, you know, just horrible posters in windows that scare, yeah. the, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then you just think, do you know what? I just don't need this. Yeah. And, um um, ultimately, you know, any any transaction, be it a, a trade, a development, or a long term investment, is it's how hard you're making yeah. your pound. Work no, absolutely. For you. So sometimes you have to say, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I can. Yeah, your make. time is valuable, isn't yeah. it? And yeah. That's one thing I've had to learn. I, I, last year, I worked myself to the bone. Mm. I was really ill in December as a result of it, and I uh, I was working like 100 hour weeks every yeah. week. And I just this year, I thought right. And work a bit smarter, yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of it's arguing with you know, neighbour, not arguing, but debating with neighbours over, you know, trying to get licences through and trying to get works through. But, but definitely, definitely, in in but in, in unpleasant markets, in very quiet and downturns, then st I, that's the type of thing I steer clear of. Yeah, you know, ab not necessarily above commercial, but above the wrong commercial. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, you know, uh, hot food. Um, takeaways, yeah, dry um, cleaners, <laughs> and at high rise. I you just can't be bothered with high rise. Even no, it's really cheap now. And normally on mortgage, very they? difficult to mortgage. And then of course, anything with cladding, and that doesn't need to be ex council. Now that can be quite modern. Well, that's a lot of people have been tied up in knots by that. Hopefully, yeah. that's going to get that's going to get sorted. And and what's your preferred way to add add value? So enfranchisement, breaking stuff down. I think your... I think the, the the most fun because they're quite they're weighty deals and they. Um, they are. Um, they keep you busy. They keep you yeah. occupied. They get you speaking to a lot of people. Um, you draw a lot more people into your the transaction. So this is portfolios, you mean? Yeah, portfolio Folios. breakup. So you're, um, you know, you're, you're. Everyone's earning. I've yeah, got yeah, yeah. Architects. I've got agents. I've got builders, building contractors. Yeah. Everybody is uh, is you know is um, you know is involved, and everyone's earning money. So that's your favourite. I mean, I looked at your website obviously to research before you came on the podcast, and I see that you've done lots of them. So, well, well that buying by the kilo, selling by the gram model, yeah. you know, works, and 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 it broadens, you know, your the source of, of the opportunity. Makes sense. Um, uh, and um, you know, so there's more likely to be, you know, kind of West End surveyors and agents acting. Um, yeah. So that they can be easier to source. And they tend to be owned by, sorry to interrupt, they tend to be owned by uh, families generally. Yeah. Sort of historical um, portfolios. They've yeah, built so up over 10, 20, 30 years. Quite often, second and third generation um, reluctant landlords, I'd say. 
So I, I bought one recently where he, he, three siblings had inherited it from, yeah. from their parents. One of them was doing all the work. They were all rolling around in the rental income. <laughs> he was approaching retirement age, and um, he, he um, so he, he and they were sort of had one eye on capital gains tax hikes, which which we keep being told are coming. Um, yeah. And um, uh, so he, he, you know, he wanted to sell, and and, and then uh, it was fantastic. Um, the, the largest um, sort of deal I was ever involved in, which was about fourteen years ago, it was one hundred and seventy addresses in, wow. in one sitting, and we actually bought from the developer, technically. So it was in South East London, and it was a, a deceased estate. So we're buying um, from it's an exec, executive sale. Yeah. Um, of the grandfather, but the great grandfather worked for the Metropolitan Railways and bought a strip of land from um, from his employers. Wow! And built a parade of shops and upper parts. <laughs> uh, and our, um, when we were doing all the lease plans and doing some um, integrative schemes for some reconfiguration, our architect came back and he said these were a real labour of love yeah. the buildings. Um, so yeah, that, so you, know. you bought up 170 units there, and what did you do to to break it down? So. I mean, what did it consist of initially? So a bit of everything, which is which is also when you talk about this favourite type of transaction. Yeah. You know where there's different elements. So commercial, had, resi. commercial, resi. We yeah. also had uh, a bit of land, so we were adding value through a planning game, and we got consent for um, fourteen houses, and then there was nice. some behind the parades. You didn't build them. No, no, we sold them on with the benefit of the planning. Fine. I mean, we were busy. Much easier. Yeah. Well, we we you know we bought forty garages. And we'd added the value by obtaining the planning. We didn't really need to. This and this was part. The forty garages were part of part of the portfolio. Part yeah. of the, I mean, garages are an interesting thing. I, I, it's not something I've, I've ever bought. There's a guy called I think Roger Dudding. Yes. Yeah. Who we nearly sold them to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two hundred grand. So, so Roger Roger Dudding is known um, for being like the biggest garage owner in the in the United Kingdom, and he's got. Ten uh, thousands and yeah. thousands of that. He's made to hundreds of millions. Very, very clever guy. He's also got one of the best classic car collections in the country. Is he also but, something to do with uh, hand uh, dryers? Uh, I think it was tick ticketing into. I think it was betting betting yeah. slip ticketing. Yeah. I think. And his his son is a guy called Guy Dudding, who was a, who used to be a buyer of mine. And uh, I always remember he turned up one day in a beautiful Aston Martin with the number plate God. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, I just I just thought, but that was his initials. To be yes. fair to him, yes. but anyway, so that's that, that's my link to garages. Um, that it made it any cheaper. <laughs> no, no, I doubt it. I doubt. But I mean, it was uh, quite a brash plate, but, but, but quite cool as well. But um, so yeah, so get, so you had the garages, and what else did you um, did you have in it? You had so some there flats. Was a, there was a there was about forty regulated tenancies um, uh, across the board. Um, I mean, it wasn't just the parade that we bought. There was a a, a, a parcel of houses in uh, Plumstead. Yeah. Um, there was a load in Broccoli, uh, but the core of it was in Honor Oak. Nice. Uh, um, so we had a lot of shops in upper parts where um, uh, where it was kind of a wrapped tenancy. So yeah. the occupation of the whole building. Yeah. And they'd been waiting for years to buy their own, and they were actually the buyer for most of those. So uh, they were going to buy the leaseholds off you? The, well, they bought the freeholds. So oh, they really? occupied the whole freehold within their commercial tenancy. Oh, so it was a commercial tenant, yeah. my bad. Um, yeah, got you. Uh, so they were kind of... Um, Ready to buy off you? Yeah, I mean, they were they, they were there and, um, you know... It makes sense. They were probably fully repairing and insuring anyway, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were, so. And, you know, it, ma it made a lot of sense for them to, to buy. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they represented... Some of them were separate. You know, the, 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 the FRI leases were just for the, for the commercial premises. We got a Sainsbury's in there. So Sainsbury's. Yeah, we got Sainsbury's. Small one or a big one? No, a little um, a metro one. Yeah, a little, oh, no, local, not, that's a Tesco local. metro, but I know what yeah. you mean. Yeah. Sainsbury's local. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And do you prefer resi to commercial? You, you, it doesn't bother you. Which do you find it's, more interesting? Um, it, my, ex I like, I do like commercial a lot, and I've always had a lot of fun with it. But you know, my whole um, experience and uh, and business model is really based around targeting um, residential property and acquisition. Yeah. So I know more about it. So if you know to wake up one morning and declare myself a, a commercial developer yeah. would be probably a bit foolhardy. But yeah. I do like the opportunities when they come along. It's more complicated, I think. It's in, well, in some ways it is. Um, the leases certainly are more complicated, wouldn't you yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. As a long-term investor, then I'm I'm commercial. I'm there for commercial all day. Absolutely. Long. Four checks a year. Um, yeah. Perfect. No, no, uh, no regular sort of. Um, repairing well, and, and crucially you can wrap them in a pension 
yeah. which you can't with resi and, uh, and if you could put resi stuff in pensions it'd be fantastic yeah. wouldn't it? but i think you'd, you'd probably have a 20 percent rise in property prices if you yes. did that yeah. but um it, it's interesting because as as when i set the development businesses up as time's gone on i've been trading for about eight years now with the various development businesses we've got and I, you, what you want to try and do is when you're making profit in those businesses is invest it into commercial and wrap it in a pension or, or stick it into an investment company and just buy up. I'm sure you've done the same. So that we've now started to look for sort of small commercial purchases out of London generally because in London they're very expensive mm-hmm. and just look for like good regional towns where things are growing yeah. and, and, and just buy small, small units like 250K, yeah. 200K, 150K, but just you know, good yields, and ideally with some development potential and just sit on them for like 20, 30 years, you know, and eventually, you know, that, in theory, in my head, that, that'll be like, like a little pension, you yeah. know. And I think a lot of developers do that. They plough their profits into longer term investments because the problem with developing is it's, you're only as good really as your last deal and it's, and it's income mm-hmm. driven. You can't sell, you could sell, if you've got a portfolio of 50 flats, you can sell it. Mm-hmm. But I can't sell my development business, even if it's making plenty of money, I can't sell it because I'm the business. As soon as I exit, unless I'm huge like Barrett's and I've got a land bank, then maybe I could. But mm-hmm. that and that's the frustrating thing I think being a developer is that if you tire out and you, it's exhausting working hard and doing property deals constantly. It's yeah. not something you really want to necessarily do till you're 85. I don't think. No. And um, even even I'm 37. I think even if I, I'm not sure I could go on at the pace I go on at the moment. You know, till I was 60, I might I might I'd give it a good go. I reckon, but. I think um, you've got to be aware of the fact that, you know, it is an income business. Mm-hmm. It's not like when you're holding portfolios, which which is not not our line of business really. Whereas I think you you do that, don't you? you keep hold of flats as well. Some, I mean, I, yeah. I prioritise um, short term um, value add. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that, that's probably the best use of my of my capital at the moment. Yeah. But I am looking forward to you know growing the. Um, you know the longer-term investment investments. side of the business, um, and um, yeah, just to have a, a steady income and to makes sense. And do you buy everything for cash or do you take finance? How does it work? Depend if you've got time, I guess. A bit of both depends on on the size of the deal. Um, borrowing does give you a lot more agility and does sort of you know give you you know expand your capabilities in the marketplace. Yeah, the, the costs well, it's been very cheap for. Well, not very cheap, but it's been yeah, they're going up now. A lot more reasonable, and it yeah, it's starting to get a bit scary. Um, particularly sort of bridging finance, which is quick. And we use a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, so, so ge- generally, I will use that. Um, you don't, you don't use private system. finance. You normally use. You normally have go done, to specialist done, banks or. You've done well. Uh, again, this was something that that um, my I introduced when you know as I transitioned to Clarence Property Group. Yeah. Was that um, being a little bit more varied in how I funded transactions? Yeah. Um, so a bit of private, private, you know, equity, a bit of um, 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 high net worth uh, individuals, bridging well. finance, okay. uh, and, and and partners. So yeah, uh, joint venture partners. Yeah. Well, that's what we do. A lot of JVs now. We we didn't do any JVs until about three years ago. It was all, a, um, it was all my money with my then business partner's money. And then about two years ago, I just thought to myself. You know, why am I not doing joint ventures? And it's, ch- it's changed our business. I mm. mean, we've literally, we've, we, we buy three, four times the amount of property that we could have bought back uh, yeah. previously. And it's great, but you only get half the money there. That's the end you problem. You do, <laughs> you do. But um, you learn a lot as well. You, you do. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I've, I've brought opportunities to joint venture partners, um, not purely for half the money, but you know, half the, the, the headspace and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the understanding of a deal. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know, another 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 angle, you know, another voice, another another approach can sometimes unlock a deal or make a deal that's not looking a lot of Are they involve them with the deal with you normally. Well once if they if they like it and they come in and we, we, and we're working together. Um, so fine, so you're actually operationally running it together. So potentially we, we, we would do. I mean if if, oh, if I had if I had an opportunity that I brought to a a joint a JV part, and I'd probably lead on it, but fine, that's be, interesting because we don't do that. Mm. So we do. Maybe we should. So you learn learn something today. I'm always always up for hearing new. You know how people do yeah, things. Yeah, well, I definitely want. If I'm giving away half the profit, I want I want half the input as well. <laughs> yeah, you well no. What when I say we we I mean really as of course my, the investors I have if they say 
you know, how much money you spent, I'm not going to go, well, it's none of your business. Well, it's like, because they've just given me a million quid of their money. Yeah. But so, of course, we, we in terms of finance, we, we, we're we very open and, and work together. But generally, in terms of running the deals, I'm doing everything. I mean, I, I very rarely do our investors get involved, which I quite like it that way because it's I'm the property guy and they're not normally in property. Mm. Um, but, you know, maybe maybe we'll look at maybe... Yeah, right. when, yeah I, mean, I hear what you say now. Um, so if they're a... Uh, uh, a contemporary in terms of yeah I think you're talking about a slightly different yeah, thing yeah so yeah so a, a backer yeah I try and keep them out of it as much as possible so that yeah so I guess we're, we're, we're taking investment from, from yeah. an investor just purely financially mm-hmm. um, although I have to say that you learn a lot from these people because invariably they've got often got more money than you have and they you know they they're very successful in their own right well uh, the, the, the um, silent partners or investors that I have I mean they do kind of force you to be very very analytical yeah yeah um and, and really look at the numbers because sometimes yeah we can as, as developers experience developers we can go on gut feel a little bit oh yeah trying to explain a gut feel to almost like an accountant yeah gut's important though yeah, it is <laughs> it is uh and it can rein you in a little bit okay and, and make you think well you know cry, cry i'm me. definitely much more on the ball with other people's money than my own i mean not that there's a massive difference between the two but but i i think sometimes people think well if I'm giving you all this money, aren't, are you just going to sort of piss it up the wall? And, and actually, it's the opposite because if someone's giving you a million or five million or whatever it is, a lot of money, you know, you, it's it's nerve wracking, you know. And, I, and when I'm when I'm doing the numbers for for an investor deal in a joint venture, I'll check them a lot more. I mean, I should check I should check them three times probably on my own deals. But on my own deals, I'm confident. I'm like, right, it's fine. I know it's a deal. But with an investor, I will go. I will look at it again. I will. Mm take more steps to look yeah, at local yeah. planning applications because you, you've got to do due diligence otherwise you, A, you look Absolutely. stupid and they might not give you any more money to yeah. invest with. <laughs> yeah. Well, they do tend to interfere less the more you do with them and the more money they make. You know, and, yeah. And the trust is built. Yeah, that's it. But I, I definitely, I am more thorough and I, and I, I will go through a, you know, kind of almost like a, an accountancy process, m- much more so. Yeah. Um, and it may still like not, you know, always make sense, and then I have to say you have to tr- you're going to have to trust me on this one. This, this is the is, this is the extra froth yeah, that we're going to get. Yeah, I can't put that on a spreadsheet, but it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we had this, so we, I'm doing an, uh, a deal on Hamilton Terrace, which is mm-hmm. arguably the best road or one of the best roads in St John's Wood, mm-hmm. and um, I'm sure you know it well. And we we managed to secure a huge lateral raised ground floor flat with a very short lease, 28 years. Mm-hmm. Um, we've just agreed the lease extension, um, which wasn't cheap as you can imagine, mm-hmm. um, and. Um, the so it's uh, I don't know if you know the double the sort of double fronted houses on ha- on Hamilton um, and yeah there was we were thinking that all the if you look at Hamilton Terrace most of the houses the maximum they sell for was about two six a square foot two thousand six hundred a square foot mm-hmm. flats there's very little that sold more than eighteen hundred a square foot nineteen hundred a square foot um, and I've done my numbers on this flat two thousand two hundred a square foot which you know we're trying to explain that to the bank value as well <laughs> you know but. If you go to the flat, you understand why, because it, 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 it's got four meter ceilings. It has a ballroom. It says on the lease plan ballroom. It's 15 meters by four and a half by four meters. I mean, mm. it's a ridiculous room. Mm. And as soon as I went in there and to have that on one floor plate, it's a bit like buying a double first floor overlooking one of the big communal gardens in Notting Hill. Yeah, or, yeah. or they sell for bonkers money because you, they're like a one in a 10 year purchase. Yeah. They very rarely come up and there's 10 buyers that want to buy them when they do. Yeah. And I think this was the same thing. And it had direct access to a fifth of an acre communal garden. So um, I think comparing it to flats that were beautiful flats, but with just a little tiny roof terrace, you know, on the first floor yeah. on Hamilton, it's not comparable. And the block of flats next door, which is going up at the moment, they're selling for like two and a half thousand a square foot, which has done me a massive favour because yeah. now I'm going to have like ten comparables. Are they new builds or are they? They're new builds, so they will sell for more. Yeah. I did allow for that, and they'll, they'll have parking, you know, and you know all of that sort of new build stuff. Yeah. But I think that for every buyer that wants a new build flat, there'll be a buyer that wants an original Victorian ballroom flat that's just yeah, brimming with pretty features. In that location, that yeah. type of road. Yeah, I think it'll be a pied de terre buyer that buys it. It's crazy that there's people that will spend four or five million on a pied terre but it's, it's London, isn't it? Really, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So generally, you're you're you're, you're telling just to flip and get out as quick as you can. You don't. No, not at all. I think having a variety of transactions yeah. is uh, is healthy because yep. um, you know there are times. You know, there's always different opportunities to get out of a, of a deal. Yeah. You know, and the first one is when you've just bought it. You know that, that you know whatever your plans are with it. Really, if your job is to buy well, there should be a profit on day one. And of course, you can order, avoid an awful lot of um, costs, banking, and 
you know, yeah. stamp. And you make your money on the buy, as they say. Is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, but, you know, there will be occasions where you can't trade it and there will be occasions where you can't sell it in auction, you can't sell it in its current condition. Eventually, and, you know, the, the, the value that underpins the, the, this, this figure is what's it worth, you know, as a finished product, all singing, all dancing, yeah. owner occupier unit. And you might have to do all of that to get out. Um, yeah. So, you, you know, I'd rather be doing that regularly in, in lots of markets so to, to be able to do it well. And it's like anything, it's a skill. You know, building is a skill. Yeah. Uh, reconfiguring and re- refurbishing is a skill. So I, th- I think it's healthy to do, to, to be doing them all the time. Keep yourself fine tuned. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, so, you know, in any one time, I suppose the dream is, is to be buying something that I'm locking away for long term investment, buying something that I'm going to get a bit emotional about and reconfigure and refurbish, make it really, you know, keep that skill of looking at what kind of finish is yeah. selling, uh, and having one of these portfolios that I'm breaking up where I'm yeah. almost asset managing. Um, you know, and the more elements to that to that yeah. portfolio, the better. So, am I asset managing? Um, you know, the commercial pr- sweating the asset. I think they call it. Don't they? Yeah, it's making it sweat. <laughs> just, just finding the value. You know, the more elements there are, then probably the more yeah. value there is in there to to, yeah. to add to. Um, so that's my that's my sort of perfect state, really. Uh, and and um, when you asked earlier about you know what the plan you know, for CPG was on, on, on day one, it was to get back to buying those portfolios. So since 21, I bought a portfolio of, of 10 units in West Norwood. Um, I bought um, a portfolio of 17 units in St Albans and more recently um, 10 buildings in Salisbury in Wiltshire. Oh, wow, that's a bit further a bit, out. A bit off-piste. Oh, if it um, works, it works. So that was really nice to be doing those types of deal. All right, they're not 170 addresses in in South East London not yet not yet um, <laughs> but I mean they became very difficult to buy there was a lot of funds so from 2010 11 onwards there was a lot of big funds people like, like Achilles, Achilles uh, <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd say that who were paying <laughs> over the odds for everything paying yeah, 95p yeah. in the pound there was no discount for, for bulk purchase at all so it kind Crazy, of blew, blew, it? blew all of us out of the water who were maybe paying 75, 80p in the pound. Yeah, which, yeah. Which I used to be a tenant of Achilles. Okay. So in Wil- uh, in Wilston, on, uh, on Wilston. Did they get it Wilson back Lane. in their rents then, did they? <laughs> uh, no, do you know, it wasn't crazy rent. It, it, was, it was like a two-bedroom penthouse. It was like two grand a month. It wasn't, it, it, it was like seven or eight years ago and I lived with my best mate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they, they all of a sudden just popped up. Yeah. They, they bought the whole building, 24 flats, yeah. put four penthouses on the top. We yeah. rented, by the, I say penthouses, they were very small, they were yeah. 800 square foot. They made a lot of noise in the market for a few years they've uh, gone away now haven't they buy much yeah. bigger things now only well, the main guy they had um he left didn't he and um yeah the main buyer but there's the, you know there are other, there are other there's there are other funds out there that that, that like that kind yeah. of uh, acquisition will, will pay strong money but you know on the whole you know um a seller particularly those kind of reluctant landlords you know inherited it second third generation from that's parents. often and, they're, and, and quite often they're you know they're hitting retirement age themselves and they're like i just want the money i want a lump sum want money out uh, it's a headache running a portfolio yeah, isn't do, it do, do i want to you know break up 15 20 units myself and, and especially if some of them are shops and some of them you know regulated tenancies or or um or need a lot of building work or whatever you know so the, the you know, getting 75, 80p in the pound for selling them all in one sitting, nice, clean transaction is um, it's very appealing. Makes sense. And, and, and just sort of change the subject slightly onto enfranchisement, because I we a lot, quite a few of the deals we do involve lease extensions, freehold purchases, the purchase, section fives to purchase, you know, areas outside of our demise. We, we buy quite a few flats that have difficulty with um, the leases and and we've made quite a bit of money buying problem purchases, which a lot of people look at it and go, well, hang on, there's a prohibition on any changes to the flat. I'm buying something at the moment in South Ken, which has that. Um, and then we, we work with the seller to, to try and unravel that and then exchange quickly and then mm-hmm. we can build what we want. Um, so you you also enjoy buying or, or like to buy em- and, and go down the enfranchisement well, route? T- tenure angles of, 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 of all. I mean, it... It's a great thing about London. It's a, it's a great thing about, um, well, particularly central London and and those that sort of not suburban London, but sort of the areas like West Hampstead, St John's Wood, yeah. Vale. There's so many different, um, such a variety of property, and and 
opportunities come from from angles and i think that you know particularly tenure yeah. angles are, are huge so i'd say m my most experience is buying um short leases just yeah. short, individual short lease units so, so mid-term or very very short <sighs> you don't care better because over makes, eight years though you can't yeah. extend it i don't think yes you? yeah that's the limit <laughs> well they're more difficult to value the, the reversion for yeah. some starters um and um but yeah i mean yeah, anything really from you know 15 years all the way up you know uh, you know up to it, the, the shorter the better because it, uh, it increases the uncertainty so if you have if, if you go to a surveyor to, yeah. to value the cost of the lease extension he'll give you three figures <laughs> and the shorter the lease the wider apart those figures are yeah, yeah of course the, the, the you know the relativity uh, equation it's very complicated by, leases i mean i, I find them fascinating mm. and i i've when you look at the um sorry to interject you, when you when you um look at the, the surveyor's report on like on our one we were in hamilton it's 28 years mm. and just all the calculations i mean it's like yeah. pff, no wonder it cost it me like three grand for the survey but, it, but, <laughs> but they, they they you know it's calculated with equate with with equations and, and, and a sort of mathematical process mm. but then then variables are thrown in which aren't they're they're they're, they're not uh, objective like the long leasehold value and mm. all of a sudden it's that's not that's not a science you know no exactly um and uh, and 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 then the argument over the over this sort of relativity that they that they apply as well yeah, yeah, yeah. so that the, po the points of argument but the shorter the lease and the higher value the unit the wider their um pessimistic and optimistic figures are and buyers only occupiers don't like uncertainty and neither yeah. the sellers so um you know that's where you know you you can capitalize you can capitalize a little yeah um so so yeah the the, the full variety i'm buying one at the moment not, not a million miles away from here actually which isn't too no. short but I have what's the address <laughs> <laughs> no, i knew you wouldn't give us that one you can tell us when you complete on I it will. if we uh, if we ever get you back onto the podcast in a few years I will. I will. um so you're buying that one and um so, so you do buy a lot of uh, deals that involve lease extensions. Yeah, my my first ever deal was uh, was a short lease that I ever did when I first started as a runner in two thousand one. Yeah. It was in Northwood Terrace. Ah, okay. Uh, Clifton Court, I think. Yeah, it was. good old Clifton Court, yeah. Mock Tudor, the yes. only Mock Tudor building in the whole of Maida Vale. And that, I, just, I think, and that was just street power. I think I walked into an agent and said, "I'm looking to yeah. buy for investment. What have you got?" It yeah. had been sat on the market. Was nobody it? interested. Yeah. And I, I say mock Tudor. It, it looks, you know what yes, I mean. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. got all wooden panelling over it. I mean, yeah. Probably mock Tudor's a bit of a stretch. Yeah. <laughs> it makes it sound like it's very old. Um, so, I mean, let's get on to some some questions about deals that you've done. So, best deal you've ever done and why? So, best deal in my previous partnership would be that um, yeah that Honor Oak. Deal. What about now in your own? So, I'd say company. The, I'd say the St Albans portfolio. Okay, why was that? Um, again, it had all those elements. It was a portfolio acquisition. I'd worked um, for a long time um, with both the seller and, and the managing agent um, to develop those relationships, to be in the jump seat yeah. when they were ready to sell. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know that took a few years. There, there were there were various elements to it. There was regulated tenancies. There was a lot of very, very pretty red brick Victorian terraced nice. housing. Some in the cons conservation area yeah. around the. Cathedral. I saw it on your website. I think. Yeah. A uh, block of flats, a uh, bit of Harpenden, a bit of London Coney. Um, so it felt like very saleable stock um, it, it, for the owner occupier market. There was a block of flats, um, which I, I was very nervous about because we were, this was 2021. So the market then was this sort of post, weird post COVID world where Booming, everybody yeah. wanted houses or garden flats. Nobody yeah, yeah, yeah. wanted anything. It's changed now. I think it has definitely yeah. recovered. And th this, uh, it was a pretty block. Um, and it was all in good condition. However, they were quite contrived. They were what are called rental flats. Right. So shower rooms, open plan kitchen receptions. Fine. Slightly weird, long, elongated rooms where they've just been desperate to, to make it a two-bedroom flat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I felt that they would be hard to sell in the market. I didn't fancy Fine. breaking them up. So I had them all. There was an assured tenant on the ground floor as well. Yeah. And I had a really big, long garden that extended all the way down to London Road, I think it was. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, and I put together an indicative scheme for a, a, just a house actually really uh, one house just one house uh, that was kind of what I thought but that's what the, the architect felt and the planner felt that was probably what was yeah. most realistic and, and, I, and I packaged it up and um, so I had effectively had that whole building underwritten and um, 
uh, so that wasn't going to I wasn't going to be completing that part of the deal so um, so you didn't buy that part of the deal well I, I, di- I did but I subsold it I see what you mean so, okay so, you, so someone's bought it to build a big so, house uh, well they, they bought it for long term investment I mean uh, really yeah. they were buying the flats and the income They were how many flats was it sorry uh, seven in total seven um, wow. and um, seven converted flats with this just big enormous garden right so I see what park. you mean it's so interesting th- yeah it wasn't a development deal it was an investment deal for yeah it makes sense but I didn't you know that would really just um, drawing the pictures, literally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, of 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 what you know somebody was buying and, and what the opportunity were, and it added a bit yeah. a, a bit of appeal, I would say, probably more than actual. It's, yeah, it's really interesting branding. to hear hear your stories because it's it's very, as I say, but very, the, you really know, it was that was the really appealing bit of the of the overall portfolio was with the houses with the freeholds. Yeah, I was less I was less keen on the flats. But Fine. So um, we, we th- those were were traded out on day one. The flat, the block of flats, um, kept the regulated tenancies. You still um, got them? Yep. And and you don't try and get them out, or are you just happy to let them run their course? Yeah, just yeah. I just guess you've made your money the, already, the, right? Yeah, so they don't cost you anything. Yeah, and uh, and then just these really really nice, very easy to sell um, uh, houses, and we we just naturally allowed them to become vacant. Um, some of them we did a little bit of work on. Um, put them back on the market, and that was a. They were they were relatively cheap houses. They were all quite small houses. They ranged from four hundred grand up to uh, I think about seven fifty was the most expensive. How big was the portfolio? So it was seven, seventeen units in total. Okay, so it wasn't yeah. huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was it was good all good quality stock. Yeah, and um, what is what is a good? I mean, just as I say, I I don't do the same sort of development that you do. So what does a good deal look like and yield wise when you're buying a portfolio do you want to get 20 percent on cost do you, is there a specific number how do you look how do you quantify that like what, what what's the aim yeah i've never been a great one for for uh, for spreadsheets and, and it having to hit a certain number yeah obviously you know I'll, I'll look at you know as i said earlier that those various points in in exiting a deal so there'll be a different calculation for each one yeah um um but again, it will all depend on the on the quality of stock. So if I'm Fine. if it is a two bedroom garden flat in West Hampstead that I know I'm going to be able to sell very quickly, I don't mind earning a small profit. Yeah, um, ten twelve percent on yeah, the on the cost exactly. if you can just flip yeah. it. Yeah, quickly. Okay. Um, um, uh, and uh, or if I know that I'm going to be um, building it out, then I'm going to have to work more. a lot harder for it. It'll, it'll need to show more. Yeah. So I guess it's it's every every deal on its own merit and and you know the, f- the famous gut feel about yeah yeah there, there's definitely a sixth sense being a developer yeah. especially an experienced one who's I, I mean you've worked your market a long time I've worked in my market for almost twenty years now since I was eighteen so nineteen years and uh, you do I think also just from asking people constantly how the market is you also build up a picture mm-hmm. I think that's the subconscious coming through because you've asked the question 50 times a month I've done the numbers on some deals before and and and, not, and, and thought why 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 am I buying it you know mm. but there's sometimes there's always just as an element that I, I'll, I'll get out of this I'll yeah yeah, yeah. Some money here yeah and how, have you had many bad deals no, what's the worst deal really. that's the, that's another question I want to ask you what is the worst deal have you got a worst deal that you was a real pain in the ass and you wish you'd never bought it um, Are you yeah. that successful? You've never had one. <laughs> I haven't had any in, 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 since uh, uh, since I started CPG. Touch Good wood, touch so. wood. Um, and no, not not many at all. Uh, I guess one that that uh, is kind of erased the memory of the painful ones. <laughs> um, I bought a, a block of flats in around Gypsy Hill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that it, South London? Yeah, South East I don't London. know South London that well. Crystal Palace. I know where that is, yeah. So, bottom <laughs> of Croxted Road. Nice, yeah, yeah, I know that is. And um, it was, um, you know, uh, I can't remember how many flats it was now, maybe 12 to 15 yeah. flats. It was a, it, I think it was originally, it might have been a, a, a PD deal at some point yeah uh and uh and it's sort of been converted into into flats and they're all good flats the breezeable condition it was an okay location had some parking but that at that point the market changed when uh they were they were classic flats that somebody that buy to let punter would buy yeah, yeah. And, and, and give you market value yeah. under occupier money for it uh, and you'd have owner occupiers for them so but it was just the market was changing. The Brexit um, vote was announced. Um, the three percent surcharge on the stamp duty came in. The abolition of tax relief, or the or the announcement of the abolition of tax relief. Yeah, yeah. On, um, Still having an effect now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and this clear George Osborne, you know, very, very clear um, 
message from the Conservative Party that they didn't like private individual landlords. But they regret that now. See what's happening in the in the rental market. Prices going up 20, 30 so I think a year. Being sent a petition about. Uh, yeah, about I've the, seen it. Yeah, yeah, about the interest. Yeah. Um, so, and I think when we came to market with them, there was um, at any one time there was a, there were, you know there was hundreds of two bedroom flats available um, of that size and at that at that price point. There was there was so much available, and. Everybody wanted Victorian conversions. Nobody wanted these dull, boring. Well, the eighties were there. It was like a, probably a bit later. Ninety. I know. The, I know this sort. I, yeah. I started working in Hayes, and there's loads of them. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then little things are a problem. There was a mechanic over the road, was just a noisy bugger. Um, so, so what happened with it in the end? We sold them all. You but, did, but yeah, you didn't yeah, make much money. Didn't you make lost, any did, money? You lost money. <laughs> you lose money. I'd, I'd probably yes. <laughs> Don't worry. I mean, we've all had probably a little. Yeah, a little. Yeah, that's it. But um, a great learning curve, and that you know, you know, all the things we mentioned about looking at your, what your exit route is, and it's very difficult to predict when legislation comes out, which yeah. wipes out a huge sector of the market almost yeah. overnight. Well, that's the problem with it, isn't it? You, that's the one thing you can't control. Is yeah. if you know, let's say Keir Starmer gets in at the next election, which is looking likely, then that he may just say, right, well. Everyone's now going to pay capital gains on their main residence yeah. from now on because we need the money. And it's yeah. like, well, people don't expect it. But I mean, it also, in terms of the businesses we're running, they're obviously the 25% corporation tax now mm. has just been brought out. It yeah. has, it does have a big impact. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, what's next for CPG? Where do you see yourselves in 10 years, 15 years? Retired on a beach in uh, Barbados or, or not? I'm not sure I go to Barbados. <laughs> but um, but uh, who, who knows? I mean, I think. I wouldn't. I've never really planned that far ahead. I have to say. Um, so over the next five to ten years, um, continue trading, continue buying for um, uh, and uh, trading and developing. Uh, I'd like to build and push the volume of deals that I'm yeah. doing each year. The number of acquisitions. Uh, I'd like to increase the, the lot size. Um, you know. Gains experience in not necessarily another sector, but maybe in an, in another in a slightly different market. Yeah. Um, uh, and and start, uh, you know, and, and and continue building the long term investment portfolio. I mean, it, the dream is to end up with enough rental income to roll around and just tweak asset manage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Little bits here and there. Have like fifty units or whatever. Talk, just you know, chill. if you if you're a bit bored and somebody drags you into a deal, then. You know, get involved in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, hu- you, I mean, you mentioned it. The hustle is is draining. Yeah, you know, it's the, tiring. The hustle to find the opportunities. That's what I find the hardest. You know, the hustle to find the right opportunities. I mean, unscrambling the deals is, is draining. But at least there's you've got something. Them. You're going to make some money. You bought, you bought, yeah. There's, a, there's something to show for it at the end. Yeah, of it. Yeah. There's, a, there's a destination. I mean, there's a destination with the hustle, but you know, it's yeah. it's, it's you're chasing something. It is like shifting sand, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. When you're dealing with neighbours who are just being difficult, and you're spending months mm. back and forth, back and forth, arguing about things, you know, or debating, as but, I say. <laughs> but you can, you have got some control over that. You know, an opportunity coming along, being offered that opportunity, mm. and securing that opportunity at the right money, you know, is far less in your control. So I yeah, you get that find that stressful. Control freak. I find that. Hard I think we all control. are in this sort of business. <laughs> I think I'm definitely a control freak. I'm dry. I try to let go, but it's uh, mm. it's difficult. You know, you'll do it well if you do it. That's the thing, yeah. right? or hopefully, anyway. Yeah. So okay, so interesting. So I think your goals are probably similar to mine, which is. Uh, to have lots of rental income, not do much one day. <laughs> but I don't know if that will happen. Let, let, let's see. So just um, while I've got you, because um, you've got a lot of knowledge and it's good to tap into it. Obviously, the government have been talking about um, getting rid of ground rents altogether. I noticed that you've bought some reversionary ground rent investments in the past. Yes. Hey, would you still buy them now in light of that? No. Um, I'm glad you said that. Well, I wouldn't either. <laughs> I think it's too up in the air. So uh, uh, the, the, the reversionary ground rent assets that I've bought I haven't held those I have traded. Just trade them on. Because um, I find um, being a f- uh, ground rent investments very tedious, and very boring, <laughs> yeah. and a lot of boring work, and for very... Uh, Little game. We always had a joke, you know, no one wants to own one ground rent, nobody wants to own, no one wants to own 100 ground rents. Mm. Ground rents are only fun when you own thousands of them. Really? Tens of thousands of them, because that's when... That's when you start, you know, really, yeah. um, you know, that's that's one worth having. That's a portfolio worth having. I know you have to start somewhere, but of course, yeah. But what about airspace deals? Interest you? 
Um, very difficult. Never, never, never done one, so yeah. you know, very little experience. Because that could come with buying the freehold and the yes. ground rents, couldn't it? So that yeah. I guess that's one reason you might want to mm. buy ground rents still. But but the, the point is the exit routes have dried up, so the really serious guys who like buying. So some guys just like the uh, will buy it on the YP on the yield. Um, some buy for the insurance and the service charge angles. Other people for the assignment fees. Um, yeah. I've spoken to so many ground rent buyers over the years, and they 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 all like something different. But the ones who buy purely want the reversionary value. No. That's why they're in for. They go. They're very sensitive to what's going on in Westminster Makes uh, sense. and, and yeah. legislation. So if they're if they're nervous, then then I yeah. and you know, I you know you, in the range of you know fifty fifty p in the pound to so as, as much as ninety p in the pound. I've sold reversion reversionary ground rents yeah. for. Um, but the guys who pay the ninety p ninety p in the pound, yeah. they, they they disappear like a puff of smoke when when the of course uh, when they start chitter chattering about this. But but I've also had some advice that um, it's not imminent. Um, I think it will take time, won't it? There's a lot of very rich yes. landowners, and I, and I think especially with the Tories in government, they're not going to want to upset people like De Walden by suddenly no. taking all of their uh, ground. But, I mean, they'll drag it through courts and appeals. And yeah, all sorts. be years, won't so, it? So it'll be a long time. Will I still buy short leases at 100%? Um, yeah, yeah. Because I think that, you know, is... Uh, the lease will remain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. And, 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 you know, you're, if, as long as you're factoring in the worst case scenario, yeah. which is you have to pay the marriage value and the, and the yeah, lease yeah. extension premium, then that's fine because that's yeah. that, that's the model of the deal. Well, well, actually, the next podcast we're going to do, so we alternate, we do one with a guest like yourself and then we do one that's more sort of... I say more educational because it's educational, but one that's more specific to a subject. So the next one I'm going to bring on um, a partner at Strether's LLP, my lawyers. Um, uh, she's a leasehold specialist solicitor, and we're going to talk everything about service charge. Uh, sorry, <laughs> leasehold and uh, share of freehold, everything enfranchisement. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be quite a good technical one. So I'll be sure to send you send you that yeah. if you want to bore yourself to sleep one yeah. one one evening. Um, and then, so just to sort of standard end of podcast questions, I guess, what would you what would you tell your younger self about uh, the world of property that you know now? What what what, what have you learned? I think Good advice. Um, definitely enjoy the strong markets and um, work hard, make the money, make the most of them, but don't stress in the downturns of yeah. the white markets because they're not forever. You know, it's yeah. very easy to catastrophize. When things slow down, yeah, they're, they're, it's a good word, catastrophize, you know, yeah, like it. It's uh, it, it 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 will come back, and yeah. I guess the secret is don't don't get carried away and don't get caught, uh, get, get carried away with the market. Yeah, um, and don't buy the Range Rover before before you've done the deal, which yeah. I think a lot of developers are guilty of. Yeah, <laughs> definitely drink from the cup when it's full. 100%. Good, you've got some. Great metaphors, I like them. Uh, some of them are, in are inherited, some of them are... Oh, you're not others. claiming them then? Uh, not, not, all them. <laughs> not all of them. So, no, that's very good advice. And then uh, the, um, the, the good old question, if you had three people at dinner, so it would be one from the world of property, one from the world of entertainment, and someone who isn't famous, who would those three people be? I did read this. You, you were very kind enough to pre-warn me about this. <laughs> I've been racking my brains. Oh, don't worry. We won't hold you to it. And, and, and the, the, someone from property. And I, my first instinct was I spend more than enough time with people in property. <laughs> you don't want any of them at your want, table. I don't want any of them for dinner. Oh. But there are some incredible characters uh, in property um, that I've met over the years. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, you're kind of tempted, should I say someone you know like an old famous architect or, uh, or 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 a legendary house builder you know but you know they're probably not disciplines or or areas of the industry that i particularly aspire to because yeah. i'm not a house builder and i'm, I'm not in, particularly involved in design and yeah so i guess there's there's my you know people in my field that that are great characters um that i've met over the Can years you pick one Someone like David Pearl. I mean, David it's... Pearl. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm actually friends with his nephew. Okay. So I've never met David, um, but his nephew's a lovely guy, yeah. and uh, he's 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 a like a legend amongst property circles. He is. I have been. Structor at... Dean is his company, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. And Pearl, Pearl and Coots. Pearl, Pearl and Coots. Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. I, or maybe I'm, I'm have to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Pearl and Coots is his company, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I, you see their boards all over. Uh, zone one. I've been at lunches with him, and, yeah, and, and there's lots of stories. He's a Spurs fan as well. Yeah, yeah. You're a Spurs fan. I'm, a Spurs fan. I'm afraid I'm I, I'm not a massive football fan, but I went to. I, I'm an Arsenal fan, I guess. Okay. So you probably want to leave now, don't you? But, but I mean, I, I mean, Spurs has got some huge property players behind it. I mean, yes. obviously Daniel Levy, um, yeah. PK, Paul yeah. Kemsley. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, Joe mean. Lewis, obviously, is yeah. like very kind of mysterious figure, but incredibly successful, has a lot of property. Yeah. So, so that's your. So, okay. So, you're going to say David well, Pearl? Well, he, he he definitely be on the list. There's some others. You know, I I I, I there's uh, I, I deal with um, Ashley Whitby at Pears Group, and he's a tremendous. Oh, really? As well, okay. Yeah. Um, You'd always have him on the list for. Uh, Is he one of the family or not? He's, he's he works so. there. No, yeah. no. Yeah, that, what a fantastic company yeah. they are. But, but there's again, the, but there's but there's a few, and then, you know, there's uh, you, you know there's, there's 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 people that you that you have around you that are great, tremendous characters, and then and, and then one day they're not around anymore, and and you always kind of think about those. There's there's uh, there's there's a guy who uh, passed away very recently, um, who I would definitely have to dinner because you know he was very you know similar um uh in terms of uh you know business model to myself yeah yeah, yeah. And, uh, a guy called mike berg very sadly passed away That's sad. yep. yeah so he'd be on the list as well and then uh Some entertainment famous um ricky gervais I ricky think. gervais yes. okay i'm gonna go ricky gervais because uh not james corden definitely not james <laughs> corden. definitely not james corden he actually he actually uh yeah, I think he does. He does it in one of his podcasts. He uh, he's got um, uh, the uh, the Mancunian guy, whoever it is, who's listing his uh, his uh, the dinner party. He's got an anecdote anyway. And James Corden's uh, one of the people. Oh really? He'll describe it as the worst dinner party ever. Oh really? With James Corden in it. Yeah, I've heard lots of bad things, unfortunately, but we couldn't possibly on this podcast no. confirm or deny. Um, and then the last one is uh, well, I think I know who you're going to say for the for. You're probably your partner, I'd imagine, <laughs> or not? You not? <laughs> I have dinner with her every night. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, no, no, my cousin Richard, and, and oh, wow. in, in the same vein to Ricky Gervais, you know, there's there's no no airs and graces, no hiding behind. Very, very, both very funny and both um, very straight talkers. Yeah. So your cousin Richard, I hope your wife's not going to be annoyed by you saying that. <laughs> I'm sure she won't. I'm sure she won't. Um, great. Well, Chris, thank you so much. If so, if anyone wants to. Put any deals your way or get hold of you? Is there a way that they can reach you? Yeah, um, they can email me. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, they can email me at chris at clarencepropertygroup.com. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not particularly uh, prolific on Twitter, but I do yeah. have, there is a Twitter page, probably a little bit more active on yeah. on Instagram. Instagram, so that you're just at Clarence Property Group, are you? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'll come up when they, yeah. when they search it. Yeah. Chris Johnson, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.